Okay. That's it. We're there. We're live. We're good. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, thank you so much for everyone for being here uh, online and in person. Uh, it's been a little while, so appreciate everyone coming back. Um, this is yet another installation of our introduction to East Asian Buddhism. Uh, and this week we're be, going to be discussing Nara Buddhism um, in Japan's early adoption of Buddhism into its culture and history. So the Nara period is only about, about four, uh, 84 years, um, but it marks a shift in Buddhism's place within Japan's history. There is obviously a lot to be said around this, uh, uh, around this short period of time, but I also have a little bit of time. So again, please understand big strokes. I'm painting in big strokes. Um, but I hope to at least lay um, the groundwork for future discussions about Japanese Buddhism going forward. Because it should be said that from the outset that Nara Buddhism is not yet Japanese Buddhism in the way that we think of it today. At this point, it's still an import from Korea and China. And from our previous discussions about those two areas, considering their timelines, uh, what was being imported was barely a wholly Chinese or Korean Buddhism. Buddhism arrived in Japan in the mid sixth century, while Chinese Buddhism was only just starting to take on, a, on more Chinese characteristics. Um, as we found in our discussions about Tiantai, Huahian, Pure Land, and Chan, these had yet to be recognized as more fully formed Chinese trends of thought at this point. Again, I make the distinction here of calling them areas of study or concentration rather than school or sect of Buddhism to better define how they were um, then rather than how we might use those terms now. And so, uh, as we'll see, that um, pertains to Nara Buddhism as well, um, and because Buddhism at that time in Japan was still very young and generalized and not as Japanized, systemized, or nuanced as we might consider it today. Right now. Yep. Do you have no, the thing no, plugged in? There, yeah, it was just a nut on the PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> with that said, some context. Uh, we need a little bit of context to help understand why Nara Buddhism had such an impact upon Jap Japanese history. So yes, bear with me. History talk. Um, Japan during the early 6th century was similar to Korea when Buddhism arrived there. It had an imperial court, but was still very clan based and not wholly a nation as we might think of it. Um, and, much of like, and much like Korea, there was a general sense that Japan's Western neighbors could provide a deeper, more robust, but robust sense of civilization, whether culturally, politically, etc. Thus, the arrival of Buddhism to Japan was not a religious adoption, but an embedded, although, you know, yeah, but was embedded within other cultural aspects coming from China and Korea. Envoys were sent from Baekje, uh, the southwestern, uh, southwestern Korea, um, in either 538 or 552 CE, depending on the source you use. But we can assume that this, this is the official introduction um, and that Buddhism was arriving in informal ways for the decades preceding and following these dates through trade routes, merchants, immigrants, etc. Nevertheless, Buddhism's for, uh, foreign kami, foreign deities, the entire cosmology of Buddhas, was only one facet of a civilizational culture that was thus, thus far providing China and Korea huge advancements. And it was these advancements that were being brought to the Japanese islands. It was not that Japan necessarily understood the spiritual or philosophical aspects of Buddhism and were attempting to adopt those, but it would have been the direct practical benefit that Buddhism provided through its form and function rather than its content. Buddhism was not being brought to Japan as a, as a distinct religion per se, solely for its religion's sake, uh, because ideas of Confucianism and Taoism were also being introduced. All these ideas over time were contributing to an overall development of a Japanese perspective and culture. 
Therefore, Buddhism was not as much a, a, only a personal faith or moral compass, but also a bearer of political concepts and social policies. In other words, it was feeding a development of social dynamics, the understanding of a larger natural world, contributing to the arts, humanities, etc., not simply a purely religious complex. Over time, this is what, uh, what is to become so important to Japanese history, the introduction of a highly organized culture. <clears throat> In presenting uh, Nara Buddhism, it is thus important to consider that it took a lot to get to a point where there was a, a centralized place where Buddhism as a faith would take a foothold. Yes, there was a there were huge advancement advancements of religious growth, but it had to be appreciated and the seeds planted before a place like Nara to take root and grow. And a lot of that came from top down from the ruling class. There had to be a systemization of introduction over time to have the lasting impact we will be discussing. It should be said that not everyone liked these new ideas. We talk about history as if uh, everyone was okay with these new ideas because they, they were the ones that prevailed. However, that's hardly the case. These foreign kami, as they were described, were not universally accepted. They were, there were great divisions between those who were willing for change and those who were not. Those accepting outside influences and those who were rejecting them. We may not be as familiar with those dissenters because they didn't win out in the long run. After all, it's the winners, as it were, who write the history. But for the purposes of our discussion here, the divisions are generally considered clan-based. For example, the Mononobe and the Nakatomi clans were against the introduction, and the Soga clan was for it. These, these were aristocratic clans who vied for power over Japan's early history. However, it was the Empress Suiko who installed the young 19-year-old nephew of the Soga clan into the role of regent in 594. He, his name, Prince Shotoku, uh, for whom a whole discussion could be had uh, in and of himself, he was raised within the Soga clan's early appreciation for the new Buddhist ideals and was considered an ardent Buddhist. He came to be well-versed in not only the form and function of Buddhism's introduction, as I described earlier, but also had developed a comprehension of the deeper religious <clears throat> and philosophical context. There's a lot to be said about him, but succinctly, he is the first to really set Buddhist teachings and Confucian ideals into the forefront of the social and political framework. He produced a, a 17 article constitution, which is not a constitution as we may think of it, outlining laws, etc., but was more a moral and ethical guideline that both government officials and the general populace should follow to ensure peace within the state. He revolutionized government administration, unifying all members of society, from the upper classes to the lowest, under the prevailing rule of harmony as it's stated in the first article, and places authority within the, with the emperor, but for whom was also subject to the first and foremost to the veneration and faith in the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma, and <coughs> Sangha, being outlined in the second article. Thus, we may attribute Prince Shotoku with establishing, establishing the first inkling of a national unity, but one that's based on Buddhist teachings. He also famously wrote commentaries of three particular sutras, the Lotus, the Vimalakirti, uh, and the Queen Shramala sutras, all three of which point to an equal, uh, equal, equalizing of all peoples, the non-distinction of one over another. A lot of credit, credit is given to him, even now, for being the spiritual teacher of an, an aspiring Japanese nation due to his efforts in service and propagation of Buddhism. After his death, Buddhism continued to grow and gain power, monasteries being built, priests studying and practicing. However, Buddhism's emphasis became more based on being a servant and protector of the state, 
rather than Shotoku's more personal, spiritual, and religious intentions. Buddhism was still having a vast cultural impact, again, especially within the aristocratic, educated, and now growing merchant class, and prominent and powerful in their own right, they would patronize the building of large temples as, as a display of power and, stayed in, and started to use them in lieu of traditional Shinto-based ancestral mounds as a source of their protection. These were not intended as places for seeking awakening per se, but were functional protectors. It should be stated that not all Buddhist, uh, Buddhist ideas were popular either. Some were not, um, not culturally congruent with the Japanese of that time, and specifically the imperial views. And it seems that they, were, they easily went without certain ideas that seemed opposed to their own perspectives and em embraced, other, uh, embraced those that were. There was a lot of selective reasoning around what teachings were emphasized and which weren't. Perceived rule, power, and order were tenuous. And so it was often the case that empowering dissenting views or emboldening the lower classes, for example, could upend that power. Remember, Japan would have heard of what was happening in China and Korea at the similar times um, around how much power uh, Buddhist monasteries, temples, and priests were accumulating and knew, knew that although helpful in many ways, Buddhist temples um, and the ordained wielded that immense power. And thus, by 624, a clerical code was developed. It was developing the, the Soni, Soni Ryo um, and continued to be refined over the next several decades. It was based on Tang China's regulations governing the Buddhist clergy, which controlled clerical activities and was strongly punitive. But it meant to ensure that the use of Buddhism best fit the needs of the ruling class. And, and so Buddhism was being exalted, yet in large part, it was meant to be controlled and overseen by the imperial, imperial government. Buddhist study and practice and the rites and rituals that were being conducted were primarily focused on the religion being a protector of the state. Thus, it was the duty of the ordained to serve the state through Buddhism via a fixed, well-defined position fulfilling what was considered their proper function. And so Buddhism grew, albeit in an inscribed way. Then came an, a new empress in 707, and by 710, a, a move of the capital uh, a short distance to Heijokyo, Hei what is present-day Nara. It would remain the capital until the start of the Heian era, with Emperor Kamu when it was moved to present-day Kyoto at the end of the 8th century. This was significant in that up until this point, for each new imperial ruler, a new capital would be established, for the previous location would have been sullied by, the death, by, its death, by the emperor's death. The move to Nara and this period of, of time would demonstrate to what extent the upper classes had become enamored with Tang China culture. This was a time when Japan was much more internationally focused comparatively. The city of Nara was modeled um, after Chang'an, the, the Chinese capital during the Tang Dynasty. It would become Japan's first urban center, and therefore economic and government administration became much more streamlined. Chinese writing was adopted, and the first Japanese national histories, the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, were written. The art and architecture took much from Chinese aesthetics and contributed tremendous works to Japanese culture. A most notable figure during this period is Emperor Shomu. He reigned from 724 to 749 and was a fervent Buddhist uh, adherent. After ma a major smallpox outbreak throughout Japan in 737, he decreed that the state uh, that the state would sponsor Kokobunji, the national temples uh, that would be established in each province throughout the nation. Each was to be a house, um, it, each of them would house uh, a 
statue of Shakyamuni and his two attendants, and a copy of the Prajnaparamita Sutra. This was not only to promote Buddhism's spread in the country, but to have Buddhism help protect and overcome crises like they had just gone through in each area of the nation. Then only a few years later in 740, he commanded that each province erect a seven-story pagoda to house 10 copies of the Lotus Sutra. The next year, he followed that up with another seven-story pagoda in each to hold 10 copies of the Golden Light and Lotus, Lotus Sutra, again, with the addition of a golden inked Golden Light Sutra written by his own hand. And finally, there must be two provincial monasteries, for one for monks, one for nuns, each with their own purpose in protect, uh, protecting the nation. Thus, by 741, the provincial temple system was fully established. In the Nara province itself, Todaiji became the head of this temple system. But the obvious major development out of the Nara period were the six Nara schools of Buddhism. And again, I should be clear here that they're not defined as schools, but areas of study. Not independent sects, but academic specialties. That each officially ordained priest would have been required to study and be well versed in. The six, six schools, Ritsu, Kusha, Kojitsu, Sanron, Hoso, and Kegon. Ritsu uh, was the school that could be considered a, a Nikaya Buddhist school, meaning it would have had its roots in early Buddhism. It was focused on the study of the Vinaya, the moral precept code of conduct, laid out as one of the three baskets the, of the Triptaka, the Pali Canon. This would have been an important area of study for many early Buddhists as a starting point for moral discipline, a foundation of the Eightfold Path. This focus of study continued for most East Asian Buddhists up to this point. The Kusha uh, is another school of Nikaya Buddhism, this focusing on the Abhidharma, another basket of the Triptaka. Kusha teachings were based on Vasubandhu's commentary on the Abhidharma, Kosha Bhasha. Kosa Bhasha. Jojitsu, the school, uh, this school was based on the Satyasiddhi Shastra. This is a, an, um, also an Abhidharma text, but translated by Kumara Jiva, which became really popular in China. It expanded on topics of shunyata, emptiness, and, um, and the two truths doctrine of the mundane and the absolute truth. Thus, accordingly, it can also be associated with East Asian Majamaka doctrine of the Middle Way. To that end, Sanran, East Asian Majamaka school, which reflects the Indian Majamaka system of thought. It also included doctrines of Shunyata, um, the twofold truth, and the Middle Way. Sanran, meaning the three treatises, however, used the three principal texts, the Middle Treatise, the Twelve Gate Treatise, and the Hundred Treatise. Again, first translated and expounded by Kumara Jiva. Next, the Hoso school considered the East Asian Yogichara school, Yogichara school. Similar to Sanran, this would have been the traditions of the East Asian version uh, which developed out of the Indian Yogachara systems rather than uh, Sanran focusing on the Majamaka focus. Thus, would have been the mind only or the doctrine of consci consciousness teachings. And finally, Kagon, the Huayan school. Uh, we've covered Huayan Buddhism in previous, in previous discussion, but to remind folks, the focus of this study was on the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avantamsaka Sutra, often considered to be the ultimate or highest teaching with the doctrines of universal interpenetration and the pervasive presence of Buddha nature in all phenomena. The influence of these schools have been long lasting, although may not have all survived over time as a primary um, area of study. There were, of course, other schools of thought in this time, although not listed at Todaiji and thus not officially recognized. These would have been outside of the government's regulation of the Buddhist order. The, the Shoran school, uh, focusing on the Mahayana Sangraha, the <coughs> Shutara school, um, on, uh, focusing on the Prajnaparamita Sutra, can be identified, but did not have a place amongst the six. This leads to the notion 
uh, that Nara Buddhism was not only found in Nara. Remember, Buddhism was spreading. Individual clans were patronizing their own temples, and the general populace would have been exposed to Buddhist teachings in various ways. Whereas Buddhism uh, within the imperial system uh, would have been purely functional, outside of that, the, the educated, uh, for the educated, the teachings would become much more alive as a philosophy and faith. It may therefore be considered popular Buddhism. Other accounts refer to it as mountain Buddhism, in that there were privately ordained priests, again, outside of the government system, hidden away in the mountain as ascetics. These would have been priests otherwise punished by the Shonin Ryo code. But on, grassroot, on a grassroots level, they had a tremendous influence on the perspective and cultural outlook of the common Japanese people. There were an increasing number of chishiki, or ordinary believers of the lower classes, who would <coughs> donate money, time, and energy to general Buddhist works of sutra copying, building temples and pagodas, and Buddhist images. So ironically, as Emperor Shomu is attempting to spread state Buddhism with the establishment of the Kokubunji, he has to rely on, the, on a few of the rogue, unsponsored priests to rouse the Chishiki population to do the very work of creating all these new establishments, copying all these sutras, and sculpting all these images. This would have been considered a huge step in the direction of a Japanese Buddhism of coordinating and incorporating not just state Buddhism, but the entirety of the social strata of Buddhist followers. It culminates into a, the huge undertaking of building the massive 15 meter tall cast bronze Vairochana Buddha, Todaiji's Dai Butsu, in, uh, Great Buddha, in 752. The amount of work, craftsmanship, dedication, to say nothing of money, demonstrated to what extent Buddhism had permeated all Japanese social classes. Now, as much as, as, as much as popular Buddhism had taken a hold outside of state Buddhism, it should not be overlooked that those state-sponsored priests and temples, despite strict restrictions, still wielded immense power, controlled vast sums of land and money. And like those in our discussions of, on Korean Buddhism, did not always avoid corrupt behaviors. A great example of which is that of Dokyo, who rose to power under Emperor Shomu's daughter, who would become a female ruler for some time. He was presumably her lover, but had used his power to influence her and to pose his adversaries, culminating in his attempt to take the throne for himself after her death. He consequently was banished from the capital, but the power grab shocked much of the aristocracy and the imperial court. She was the, thus the last empress until the 17th century because of this, and only men were then considered as rulers. Regardless, the next emperor was much less taken with Buddhism because, as a result, and his son would become Emperor Kanmu, who, um, and would be the first of the new Han era. To distance himself and the court from Nara Buddhist influences, he moved the capital to present-day Kyoto. However, when, uh, uh, however, what I haven't mentioned here and looming all, over all of this is the emergence of Saicho. He was born in 767, was ordained at 20 years old, thus 787, at Todaiji, but only a few months later retreats to the mountain, Mount Hia, where he would train and study. He would later gain the attention, attention of Emperor Kamu, and he and Kukai would travel to China under the emperor's orders. But we'll have to save that story for another time. I want to wrap this up mentioning a few things. We have now discussed several histories of how Buddhism spread throughout East Asia, 
each with their own nuances. However, for me, underlying them is an appreciation for what Buddhism meant to each of these cultural areas. It provided a way to see the world differently from what had been in place previously, often a fractured tribal-based social system, as we, might, as we might describe it today. In China, Korea, and Japan, Buddhism provided not, uh, not a necessarily religious system, but a sociocultural one, one based on humanity and humanness. It shifted the backdrop of separateness to something more inclusive, a need for community, even if only through protection. Prince Shotoku's approach of emphasizing social harmony uh, over all else rings in my ears. We may not always relate to these histories and may even see them as pointless, fair, but the way in which Buddhism would embed itself within each of these cultures, again, not necessarily as a religion, but as a way to see the world, is a lesson that I hope each of us can relate to. We can see how the arrival of Buddhism to America, or the West in general, has been contextualized from orient orient Orientalism through the beatniks to Buddhist modernism, and hopefully now into a new era of how we relate to these teachings. We cannot adopt such vastly foreign concepts without first understanding their context so that we can become more versed and more fluent in that translation. If we allow to learn from our past through discussions like these, we can start to more fully understand and truly embrace a new cultural perspective. We are in the infancy of Buddhism outside of Asia. And it's up to us to decide how we are going to uh, embed any possible, uh, possible cultural shift into our worldview. Just as in Japan, there were many aspects of Buddhism that were not culturally congruent upon its arrival. However, over time, as we'll cover in future discussions, Buddhist teachings would become a foundation of cultural change, one based on humility, gratitude, and equanimity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those who don't know, these are the deer of Nara. Um, if you go to the city of Nara, they are just everywhere. You, they're just wild there. I mean, there's so much so that you can buy the treats to feed them by hand. Um, they, they come up to you just like this because they'll knock you over. <laughs> Where's you, have to, you have to be careful, Dad. <laughs> you have to be careful, Dad. Yes, yes. Keep chasing, keep, they <laughs> just keep chasing, never give up. You have to be careful. <laughs> they do really want to get fed. Yes. <laughs> um, um, and I will say, uh, just as an aside also, um, and since Jake has the picture of Tadaiji there as well, so the, this image, the, the Daibutsu, um, again, 15 meters tall. So these little, these little um, in the in the aura, the little uh, bodhisattvas around uh, Vairochana um, are probably about my size, maybe a little shorter. Um, but that then in within the temple, um, just below the main roof line, the topmost roof line, you'll see um, you see the curved roof line. Below that is a big square, uh, what looks like a black box. But those are actually doors that open up, and that's where the Daibutsu's face would be looking out. So during New Year's celebrations or uh, special cel uh, special ceremonies, they actually open those doors. And so you can, from where the picture is being taken from, you can see the Buddha's face and so as, they, as he looks out to Pan. It's, it's, I mean, it's one of those. Since you, since you raised the idea of, of Todaiji, just to let you know, that is the largest single witness structure in the world. And it's one third, it, currently it's the largest single witness structure in the world. Currently it's one third the original size to give you an idea of how massive it was. It was. The, yeah. the, there were other buildings that were out to the side of that. Hmm. So you're looking at the main building that was not destroyed by fire. 
but the other two thirds that were out to out around the sides of it were destroyed by fire in previous previous mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm. okay.